Hello, hello, and welcome everybody. Um, so this is the last but certainly not least event of our four day summer summit. So I hope for those of you tuning in to the multiple events this week have been enjoying it. And for those who are just now tuning in to our health expo today, we welcome you and thank you for, for tuning in. Um, it's gonna be a very exciting two hours. So did, today we're gonna be going over a few things on our agenda. So first we'll hear from our, my colleague, Zachary Pohl, who'll be giving everyone an overview of our health program, both here in Silicon Valley and globally. And we'll be giving you some updates there. Then we'll switch gears to our highly anticipated fireside chat, where we'll be hearing from Dr. Joan Zoltansky, the Chief Experience Officer at University Hospitals. She'll be speaking alongside our wonderful Managing Director of our Plug and Play Cleveland program, Jennifer Thomas, um, and they'll be speaking about the health impact of reopening. Then we'll go right into it. We have 19 amazing startups that'll be showcasing their companies, use cases, and fundraising updates. And last but not least, we're presenting one of our corporate uh, partners with our Corporate Innovation Award. So stay tuned until the very end. We'll be showcasing who's making great strides over the last few months. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Zachary Paul. Take it away, Zach. Welcome, everybody. It is incredible to have all of you here for our Health Batch X Expo. Uh, welcome to the incredible audience that we have. Our startups, our corporate partners, the investors, and the entire ecosystem of healthcare innovators. Welcome. Speaking of that global reach, Plug and Play now has 36 locations across the globe, eight specific to healthcare. Silicon Valley, Cleveland, Munich, Shanghai, Kyoto, Sao Paulo, Abu Dhabi, Singapore. Welcome to everybody who's representing all of these countries um, as well as the others. It's amazing to have you. It's amazing to have such a diversity and breadth here today. And speaking of that, Plug and Play now has over 400 corporate partners across the globe in the 17 different industries that we work in, 33 global corporate partners just for Plug and Play Health. And they cover three main buckets, hospital systems, pharmaceutical companies, industry and government. And that's one of the best things about Plug and Play Health in our ecosystem is not just the depth that we have, but also the breadth. Welcome to all of our corporate partners who are in attendance with us today. What's amazing to see is the focus areas. These are the three main hubs, Silicon Valley, Cleveland, and Munich. There are some similarities across healthcare that you're looking for. For example, chronic disease management. Then there's also differences, which is interesting to see too, which is dictated by the different corporate partners in those locations. So in Silicon Valley, medication adherence, centers, wearables, and devices. In Cleveland, though, hospital workflow and care coordination are the priorities, while in Munich, our corporate partners are focused on quality control, sleep, nutrition, as well as allergy. So it's really interesting to see um, the similarities as well as the differences that's dictated by the differences in the corporate partners. And our health portfolio. Plug and Play Health was the most active digital healthcare investor in the world in Q4 of last year. And we've now made seven investments just this year alone. And you are able to see them at the top as well as our entire portfolio below that, which includes companies that have been acquired by larger companies like Apple, as well as ones that have IPO'd. We are incredibly excited to have these new investments in our portfolio, not just for the ROI standpoint, but also the value that they're going to be able to provide for our corporate partners, as well as the entire ecosystem. So very excited to have them here with us today. To give context um, about our COVID-19 accelerator in October, um, BARDA, a division of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, came to us and became a partner. And one of the reasons was, if an infectious disease outbreak were to happen in the U.S., to utilize plug and play as part of their ecosystem to find technology to both diagnose it and then mitigate the spread. And unfortunately, just a couple of months later, COVID-19 hit. Plug and play, therefore, already had a leg up in finding technology. And because of our global presence, we said to ourselves, we need 
to be global leaders in using innovation to uh, flatten the curve. But then we also said not just to flatten the curve, but to get ourselves back to normalcy, to get ourselves back to a place where the world was pre-COVID-19. And that's what we're doing with our COVID-19 accelerator. How can we take the most innovative companies in the world that can scale now with larger companies that are willing and able to work with them, not to make commercial engagements and results happen 12 months from now, not just six months from now, but 60 days from now. And that's what we're working on. And we're starting with three main um, industries, health, supply chain, and retail, and then going beyond enterprise tech and fintech to make sure that we're truly having a global change for the better in response and being proactive to COVID-19. And all of our industries have taken a leadership position um, in, co in response to COVID-19 to help everybody in the audience, whether it's for yourself or whether you're a leader at your company, to be able to not just respond to COVID-19, but be proactive and lead to be able to find the opportunities for yourself and your company as we go beyond the pandemic. You can see all of the content and virtual events that we've been doing here at our microsite, pnptc.com forward slash COVID-19. In terms of health, when we all went work from home, uh, we had some questions. Um, are, what's work going to be like? How are we going to be working? Are we going to be able to provide the same level of value that our corporate partners expect from us? And we learned two things. First, we're working harder than ever. <laughs> And which I feel like may resonate with a lot of the people in the audience. Um, and then number two, we learned that we can provide unique value to our partners that we weren't able to before. It's never been easier to be able to get high level people in the same room at the same time um, on demand as it has before. You know, just on Tuesday, we held a private invitation only uh, payer pharma event. And we had a dozen of the top leaders throughout the United States in the same room at the same time collaborating. What are you thinking about this issue? How are you evolving into this? And we weren't able to do that before. And we're also able to get some of the best startups in the world to be able to quickly come into meetings to meet with some of our partners. So we've never been able to provide some of the value that we've been able to because of the virtual world that we now live in. You can see all of the webinars that we've done with our partners, Drive, Roche, University Hospitals, Eli Lilly, and UL below, as well as others. We are here today for an incredibly exciting event, our Health Batch X startups and our demo day to hear from them. You know, when, we, when these uh, startups were chosen by our partners, um, we said these are the areas that we need to be in five, 10, 15 years from now. Now, here today, they are more relevant than ever, not only to meet, but to work with now because of what's happened since. Um, innovation has gone from 15 years from now, from one year from now. And so today, these companies, in spanning six different categories, clinical trials, pharma, chronic disease management, digital therapeutics, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, decision tools, analytics, population health, diagnostics, drug delivery, employer benefits, wellness, are going to be presenting to you today so that you get the opportunity to figure out which ones you'd like to work with. The team, um, we all of us are incredibly excited to announce the promotion of Alex Tran to principal. Um, a lot of you know him as our ventures associate who's able to provide immense value, not just to our startups, but to our corporate partners in health and insurance. And we've also been able to keep the amazing team across the globe that's able to provide the value to everybody in our ecosystem. My name is Zachary Pohl, Corporate Partnerships. My email is z.pohl at pnptc.com. If you are a startup who'd like to get involved in our ecosystem or apply for Fall Batch 11 or a leader at your organization and company and you are interested in becoming a corporate partner, please reach out to me. I'm very excited to hear from everybody. And with that, uh, I'm incredibly excited to now give the stage to our managing director in Cleveland, Jennifer Thomas, who's going to be doing our fireside chat. So take it away, Jennifer. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. 
and also welcome uh, Dr. Joan Zoltansky uh, to our chat as well. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to Summer Summit and our Health Expo. We're so pleased to have you here. My name is Jennifer Thomas. I'm Managing Director of Plug and Play in Cleveland. And in Cleveland, we're part of our health vertical, uh, working to connect the world's best startups with our national and global health partners so we can help them improve patient experience and outcomes, enhance the provider experience, and also build a robust startup ecosystem where we are. Today, I have the unique pleasure of sharing with you a conversation with Dr. Joan Zoltansky. She's incredibly knowledgeable and an innovative physician, and I think you're really gonna enjoy it. But be before we get into the conversation, I'm just going to give you a brief bio so you, uh, you can get to know Joan. So Dr. Joan Zoltansky is the Chief Experience Officer for University Hospitals Health System, located in Cleveland, Ohio, and serving the surrounding Northeast Ohio region. University Hospitals has 14 hospitals and more than 27,000 employees. Dr. Zoltansky has been leading change in her role and has successfully implemented medical, clinical, and operational best practices that have led to sustained and measurable results, which you'll hear about today. She works to improve the wellness of people in Northeast Ohio by ensuring that high quality healthcare is delivered with equity, with empathy, and focused on the individual needs of both the patients and their families. Um, but now during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, she started to lead a team of healthcare subject matter experts to really help employers thoughtfully return employees and customers to the workplace. So she gathered together a team of physicians, nurses, industrial safety experts, all collaborating together to support business strategy during this unprecedented time. And we're really gonna dig into this today. So beyond her CXO role, she's an intensive care physician and works clinically in the division of pediatric clinical care medicine at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, which is connected to UH. She enjoys teaching and mentoring students as an assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University, a school of medicine in Cleveland. And there's more. Within UH, she provides clinical leadership as the medical director for UH Physician Credentialing and Verification and UH Executive Services. Uh, Dr. Zoltansky is a nationally recognized subject matter expert on safety, medical quality, and patient experience, and we have the honor of having her here today at the Plug and Play Health Expo during our summer summit. So welcome, Dr. Zoltansky. Well, thank well, you, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Great. So a lot has happened since March, and we're effectively going to focus on the health impact of returning to work. Uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, just talk a little bit about patient experience. It's really become an important role in the hospital. It's, it's almost like the gauge of the hospital's ability to deliver safe, high quality, and satisfying care to those you serve. And that's a heavy lift. So can you tell us a little bit about how you approach your role as CXO? Well, sure. Uh, it, it is really about the whole experience of care, the total experience of care, and that includes the provider of care as well. So we work really hard to think about how we can provide the highest level of medical care for our patients, because you can't have a great experience if your experience was unsafe or you weren't provided with the highest level of care. So we're very integrated with safety, quality, and the provider experience. So the, the patient experience, but also the provider experience. Yeah, that's great. I imagine that um, that once uh, COVID-19 hit, uh, I imagine your role and the focus of how you serve the hospital changed quite a bit. Um, what was the most drastic thing that you had to address? Um, if you're looking and thinking about within our hospital system for the care of our patients, um, our model of care was like many businesses upended. We focus and we're very good at providing an incredible bedside experience, connecting with the patient, communicating with the patient, delivering that high quality care at the bedside with the provider, the patient, their family, their loved ones. And when we couldn't have visitors at the bedside, um, we couldn't have uh, other people come in with patients for visits to try to, to, try to uh, stop the spread of COVID, we had a lot of challenges with our model. And what we really did was had to pivot our model and what I wanted to be very conscious of was that we didn't say, well, we're stopping that. What I wanted to say, what I was pushing people to say is how is that, what is the replacement? How are we pivoting that? 
And so we worked um, and have a lot of digital solutions and other uh, workflows, best practices to try to replace some of those bedside interactions with digital interactions with asynchronous communication. Right, and, and you were uh, telling me previously about kind of expanding the circle of the patient um, so that it includes their family. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? I love that concept. Well, that's one of the fundamentals and that's the reason why we've had really unprecedented success in our system around patient experience outcomes and quality outcomes is we think about the patient, but we also think about their circle, their network. Who is it that the patient identifies as their caregivers, their loved ones? And that is really where we focused on communication. We have always focused on great communication with patients, but we really tried to expand that network. Within the past five years, we've been very conscious of that. And so that's where when COVID said, no more visitors, we said, what is that replacement? So a good example is, um, when we do shift change in our hospital system, we go to the bedside, the clinicians go to the bedside and talk to the patient and talk to the family and say, this is what happened overnight. This is the plan of the care for day. This is what we need from you, the patients, the families, what do you need from us? And when COVID came, we couldn't have visitors. We have found ways to pivot that. We use a digital solution that we do the same thing because we still have to go into rooms. So we go into the room, talk to the patient, but also we patch in the family digitally at home so they can know, hey, we're thinking about your mom, we're thinking about your dad, your husband, whoever it is, this is what we talked about overnight and this is what the plan of care is for the day. Because although the family's at home, they're still an important part of the care of that patient and an important part of the health of that patient. Right, so you're effectively distilling out what your value was even at the bedside and then how do you provide that when you can't be at the bedside? That is, that exactly, is exactly the conversation. The conversation that we have is was. what is our value and how do we pivot that now in COVID? Now, how do we stop this or stop that, but how are we pivoting? How are we reinventing and still maintaining that value? Do you estimate that that will continue on? I mean, do you think that that's something that's kind of permanently changed? I, I, I am hoping that it is permanently changed and certainly um, that is what we're working towards because although we've had families at doctor's appointments, at the bedside, um, we also know that families and loved ones, caregivers don't always have the ability to be at the doctor's appointment at the bedside, but they still want that connection with the doctor. When you're caring for your mother or your loved one, you still want that connection. And so we're taking these practices and these practices are here to stay. That's excellent. So let's uh, move into talking about your Healthy Restart Playbook because uh, it's so fascinating and valuable. Um, and what I discovered as, as I'm going through it is it's not just about patients anymore. Uh, it's about their families, as you said, expanding the circle, but now even wider circle, it's about the economy and workplaces, employees, customers, and kind of setting into practice uh, something that allows us to function in some version of normal during this pandemic. So can you talk about sort of the, uh, the origins or the impetus for designing this book? How did it come about? Um, well, really, uh, when, when I heard Zach uh, give the in introductory comments, he said what we were hearing from businesses, which was in, in organizations, employers in our community, they were reaching out to us and saying, we need health information to flatten the curve. And that's what he said. And I said, boy, I've heard that so many times since the start of this from outside of the hospital system. And so what we did is you see a, a, a picture here of our experts um, in, our, in our system. And they were businesses, employers, organizations were asking us for guidance on how to keep their people safe, how to keep their facilities, their equipment safe, how to lead during these times. And We've been doing this even before the times of COVID, uh, during pandemics, during um, outbreaks. And these are experts in our system that were doing this within our system. So you see infectious disease experts that uh, were helpful in helping us create content for the community. Uh, infection control experts who are also infectious disease doctors, but that little different bent of how do I control the spread of disease within my own facility? Um, pathologists who think about testing, businesses all want to talk about testing, PCR testing and antibody testing. And so we had those experts come um, in and help us develop content. Then also operational people, operational experts who happen to be physicians, but they're also operators in our system who are thinking about 
what is our volume going to be like in November? What is going to happen with the epidemiology? Um, and what will our volumes be like? What are the revenue projections? Those types of things. So from a strategic standpoint. So this is what we've been doing in our system. And this is what we were hearing from the community that their needs were. So we gathered these experts and really tried to bring back content to them that we hope was of value. Right. And, and were you fielding lots of calls? Um, were, were sort of different physicians getting calls? You, you shared with me about some Saturday morning sessions that you had. So all of us, anybody that worked, I think, at any level in the hospital systems, our phones and emails were lighting up with questions from employers, nonprofits, the business community um, around how can we safely do things. And, um, and we had been talking about it in so many leadership meetings that uh, one morning of about, about a month and a half ago, a little more than a month and a half ago, I looked at my CEO and we said, we just need to put some structure around this because we want to help, but also we want to help everyone, not just the person who has my cell phone number or his cell phone number, but we want to help the whole community. So we take these calls, think about this, but also we make content that's free and available to the entire community because this is really why we're trying to do it. We're trying to really protect the people of the community and provide this information because they're going into public spaces. And so how do we help those leaders of those spaces to do it as safely as we possibly can? And it will effectively reduce how many people get sick and have to come into your hospital as sick people. Um, That's exactly why when we talked about it, uh, certainly because of our care for the community and our infectious disease docs, doctors and experts all said, the same thing. They said anything we can do to flatten the curve and they know that going out into public spaces is a risk and that's exactly why they were invested to help. That's awesome. And so with this Healthy Restart Playbook, you've effectively taken your core competencies and developed it for business, industry, manufacturing, schools, and so on. But you happen to do it very quickly. Uh, can you talk about the speed at which you were able to do that and, and uh, what did you have to do to get there? So we really just um, took a brief pause before we put things out um, and, and listened um, and talked to a lot of different types of employers. Um, Cleveland is a, in part a manufacturing town, as you know. And so we talked to a lot of people in manufacturing, talked to a lot of nonprofits, community organizations, um, financial firms, you know, large Fortune 500s down to the you know, mom and pop manufacturer in our backyard and really just listened and people had a lot of concerns and then we really put them into a few different verticals of how we were hearing it from the business community, not how we were thinking about it, but how they were thinking about it. And they were worried and wanted answers on how they could keep their people safe. So how do I keep their questions or how do I keep my employees and my customers safe? How do I keep my facility and my equipment safe? What are the cleaning protocols, those types of things? And then also a lot of questions, certainly from the executive level and how to lead during this time, how to maintain trust with your employees, with your customers, and how to lead in a time when medical information is rapidly changing. And so we gathered those questions and we had our subject matter experts that you saw and many others just do their best effort to give people information on those topics and give them some themes, but then also some practical examples of if you can't physically distance, what does this actually look like on a manufacturing line, those types of things, because we have situations where people can't physically distance yet still have to do their job. So just to provide some general content and then also some specific examples. Right. That's right. Um, I imagine there's, a, there's a, a difference between what matters for a manufacturer versus what matters for a school when it comes to reopening. Um, can you give a few examples of, of you know, what, what does a manufacturer have to do or versus someone who's working in a high rise? So one of the things uh, which was very interesting is to see how other industries think about PPE, for example. When I wear PPE, when I practice clinically, I'm wearing PPE to protect my patient, to protect myself in some sense, but for the entirety of my career, I've known this is to protect the patient. Um, and so when we wear gloves, when we mask, the way that we use them, we don't wear gloves all day. We wear them for every specific task, wash our hands, then throw them out. 
Um, whereas if you're working in manufacturing, oftentimes they wear this gloves to protect their own hands and they wear masks to protect their own lungs. And so this has been part of what we've been helping them educate their workforce about that. It is in some part to protect yourself, but it's also to protect other people. And that's a culture shift. Um, so that certainly uh, is one example of, of some of the things that um, we're trying to help educate on. Got it. And um, let's talk about what the subject on everyone's mind. What do we do about bathrooms and elevators? How do you uh, how do you guide employers on that? So we uh, actually uh, go through with them. We have general advice that you want to space out for a few reasons. One is to try to stop the spread uh, within that specific area, um, but also is to decrease the density. So we talk about closing down every other bathroom stall, closing down sinks in the bathroom to physically distance people while they're in there, but also so that so many people won't gather in there. So we have talked to them about closing down every other uh, facility that's in there, and then also to queue outside as opposed to inside. Some of the practical, practical suggestions. But there's a balance, right? You can't have a completely sterile environment in either of those places. No, and we're uh, very purposeful when we talk about it, that this is not about stopping COVID, this is about slowing and trying to be as safe as we possibly can. We don't know, I wish we did have a good way uh, to say that this stops it. Um, and, and certainly what we also, I think, have been helpful to businesses about is they do have vendors approaching them, telling them that they can stop COVID. And so we oftentimes look at what they're selling the businesses and those types of things and say that doesn't really make sense to us um, and trying to provide some of that guidance and then really bringing people back to those fundamentals. We have a phrase that we say, and it resonates in our system and businesses seem to like it, but we say screen, clean, and six feet in between. So what is the screening process for your employees as they're coming in uh, to work? What is your cleaning process? And then what are your physical distancing parameters? Got it. And then let's talk about trust too. You mentioned it earlier. Um, I'm assuming uh, trust plays a role in that even if employers sanitize the heck out of a workplace, it might not be enough for customers or employees to feel that they have assurance that the place is clean. How do you, how do you advise employers on that? So that is one uh, practical example of a great place where employers can build trust. Um, trust is about communication and not leaving things to the imagination um, about communicating. Sorry. Computer. Sorry, but trust is about communicating. And so we have talked to them about oftentimes we do cleaning processes at night. Um, in the business world, they come in and clean at night and we're talking to them about what about bringing those during the day so that your employees and customers can see what you're doing so they can see that those cleaning processes are going on. And then also to be purposeful about how they're communicating to their employees and customers that they're doing these things. What are the signage? How can they remind people? Um, so to build that trust, you have to communicate what you're doing to let your employees and customers know that their health and safety is your number one priority. And I imagine demonstrating is important too. So leadership has to sort of wear the masks and, uh, you know, walk the walk. That, that is very important. Um, it doesn't matter, just like it, it's no different than any other initiative. Um, if your leadership hasn't completely bought in on the importance and the seriousness of it, it won't happen at, at the ground level. Um, so making sure that your leaders are all on board with what the company plan is. I actually just had a conversation with a organization just prior to this talking about the same thing that you have to make an organizational decision of what your priorities are and then everything will flow from that. Got it. And then it seems like, you know, well, obviously there's no vaccine yet. We have heard that there's a steroid that reduces symptoms, but it seems like that, that you know, the, the large tech companies announced that, you know, work from home all the way through the end of 2020. Um, it seems like there's going to be infinite demand for this. And um, some businesses then say they're going to reopen and they pull back, they delay it. Are you guys going to expand this service? 
we're really taking our cue from what the needs of the community are, the business community, but to date it has been, there has been a very high demand for this information and for services around that. It's really, uh, it, it's not going down, it's really going up. And I think that we, uh, that I feel comfortable uh, that it is a, a value service because we do think we're in for the long haul, that this is a marathon and not a sprint. If it were a sprint, I'd feel more comfortable saying, you know, just go home and in a couple of months when this is gone, we could all come back to work in business as usual. But unfortunately, that's not what we foresee. And that's why we want to help businesses to learn to live with this and our community to learn how to coexist with this in the safest way possible. And have companies have come back to you and said, look, we like what you've told us in general from this healthy restart playbook, but let's go deeper. Like let's say they're food processing or some, something that really has people in close proximity, they've got to figure this out. Certainly depending upon the type of businesses, you know, what you mentioned in, in food processing and oftentimes again in manufacturing, um, you know, people are in very close proximity and in the lean uh, world of manufacturing, physical spaces got smaller and smaller and smaller. And now we're trying to help them understand how can you physically distance? How can you place barriers? How can you have that manufacturing line where in this lean world when we're tight in, how can we do that? So there is certainly a, a need from many organizations to go deeper and our infection control, our infection disease, infectious disease experts, industrial hygienists that are normally doing this in our facilities I think have been a great resource to them to do that. So as you learn more and more by going deeper, will you update the public facing content of the Healthy Restart Playbook? So we're updating that constantly even now because the recommendations are changing frequently, uh, weekly, daily, sometimes hourly. And so we're always updating that as quickly as we can because what we have been very purposeful in that whenever we work with a company and we talk to them about this, whatever we're learning, we want to share with the greater community. So not just to have it for one company, but as much as we can to get this content out there for everyone, to keep everyone safe. Great, and what we can do is put a link to the Healthy Restart Playbook in the, uh, in the chat so everyone can see it. And I also wanna let people know that we do have some Q&A time. So please, if you have a question for Dr. Zoltansky, please, we are live, so please put your question in the Q&A section. Um, I have a, a couple more questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm feeling that, um, that a, a, a manufacturer, a business, a school will feel more comfortable if they have sort of a, a white coat uh, advice in the room. Um, but also, in order to do this, we need some technologies um, because it's not something that just people can do. You know, a reopening with success will require a little more technology. Do you think we have those technologies? Do you think we're ready? Um, you know, those technologies are developing and um, some of them are ready and some of them uh, I think are rapidly developing and will be ready. Uh, there is certainly a need in the business community uh, around, especially in large organizations, if people are expected to screen their employees every day for fevers, for signs and symptoms of COVID, there is a spectrum on what businesses do. Some businesses expect employees to self-manage and say, you tell me if you're feeling sick. Um, and then some businesses want to do that themselves. They want to actually temperature take themselves and all of these types of things. And so if you have a large, uh, a large employee population, you can't do that unless you have a digital solution. So that's one example where there is really a need around those digital solutions to easily uh, help employers understand who is safe to come into work, uh, who needs to stop and see the doctor, who needs to, who they need to work with their local health departments on. So it gets complicated when you are employing people, when you're bringing customers in. And I think that the what, what one thing that's good is the signs and symptoms, you know, we're learning more about, but the ability for businesses to digest this information, to manage populations, their employees, I think can only really come when there's a digital solution to that. Awesome, that's good for our startups to hear. We'll be hearing from, as Zach said, 19 of them in a minute. Um, I am going to switch right into Q&A because we do have a couple of interesting questions. 
One's come across uh, uh, regarding which units within the hospital have been most affected by COVID-19. Um, for example, uh, the way in which care is delivered for patients and caregivers. Um, if, if you're talking about um, where uh, in hospital systems are infections happening on the employee side, um, so we have people, of course, in our hospitals that have COVID, um, but we have been very meticulous in how we are using PPE and how we're thinking about it. And actually, we do not have outbreaks of it from patients. Um, people are wearing their PPE. They're taking it seriously. They are um, following all the precautions. And I'm not saying we haven't had anybody at all get that, but we have not had outbreaks of it from patients because uh, we are prioritizing the health and safety and people, it's been interesting to work with businesses because some businesses will say, oh, if I encourage people to wear PPE, if I have these standards, then it will scare people. And what we find, and actually from our own patients too, is people want to see businesses and that we're taking those precautions. So um, we haven't had thankfully um, outbreaks from it, it, uh, in COVID in our own uh, health system because again, we're taking it seriously and doing the things that we're recommending to others. Great. And then um, let's spend the last couple of minutes maybe um, talking about testing. Um, a question has come across about how do we help skilled nursing facilities and assisted living? Um, should we start testing employees and residents on a regular basis? Should we use antibody tests, PCR tests? What's your th what are your thoughts on that one? So there's a lot of work going on in that space nationally and um, some places are testing the employees of nursing homes and residents to try to control that. Um, anytime you have people in a, a confined space, it's a risk and especially for longer periods of time, those types of things. So um, as far as testing goes, and this may go back to your uh, question about the digital solution, because certainly we have been talked to organizations that are working on uh, immunity passports and those types of things and tried to provide them with uh, what we know um, around testing. But the testing that we are doing is for patients with symptoms. Um, and that is that PCR testing, that quick testing. Um, and then the immunity part of it, the antibody testing is something that you will hear about, but still people are working to understand what that means. Even experts in this are still working to understand what that means. Um, the questions they're trying to, to understand is, if I had COVID, am I able to get COVID again? Which is a challenge for when people are thinking about immunity passports where I can hold up my phone and go into the concert or go into work, those types of things is, um, that has not been vetted yet. But I think what I, I think is maybe reassuring um, and, and maybe for a business model somewhat reassuring is we are learning things rapidly. We know a lot more today than we did a month ago and so we think about the role for testing, PCR or antibody testing. Maybe in another month or so, we will have some of those answers that businesses need. And I imagine that businesses are also asking you, um, what's the protocol once someone has been determined that they're sick? How long do they stay away? How do we know they're safe? Um, because there are many antibody tests out there. Some give a large percentage of false positives, so we just can't be certain. It's a it's touch and go, as you said, until we get a little more certainty. Um, and the testing space is another area where we want to provide guidance where we can to help businesses understand. Um, someone may approach you about testing. It's a little bit like the cleaning, uh, someone approaching businesses about cleaning, saying they can spray something and it'll be COVID free for a year. Um, that's probably not true. Um, testing is the same way to approach testing and say, we have tests, but we say, what is the quality of those tests? And where are those tests? Um, how do you know that those tests are valid and the quality level of those tests? And then finally, uh, someone asked whether we would go back to more in-person visits or more telemedicine. Um, what do you think the, uh, the balance will be there? I think that telemedicine is here to stay because people see the impact of it. And also patients uh, will see the impact of it and are seeing the impact of it. And we have very positive feedback on our telehealth visits. And so our customer has spoken. So 
telehealth is here to stay, but certainly we will go back to inpatient visits. There are some things that can only be provided in person. And also there is, there is part of that in-person visit which develops that relationship, which is the basis of health and wellness. Great. Well, Dr. Zoltansky, I want to thank you so much for joining us today um, with your wisdom and for, you know, your whole team in putting together the Healthy Restart Playbook. We do have the link in the uh, chat, so um, go grab it, if you will. And please note that it is downloadable, but that uh, Dr. Zoltansky and her team will be constantly updating it. So check back frequently, I guess that would be the right thing to say. Yes, yes, you can watch for updates on, on the website. And again, we make them frequently because we want uh, everyone to have the information that we have. Great, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go back to Ava and uh, get on to the startup presentations. Thanks everyone. Yep. Thank you again to Jennifer and Dr. Zoltansky um, for sharing your insights on how to safely reopen. Um, I learned a lot. There was a lot of insights shared there. Um, so now let's go ahead and get right to our startup pitches. To introduce myself, my name is Ava Askeri. I'm the Senior Program Manager for our Health Accelerator Program here in Silicon Valley. So I will be your MC for today. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with these upcoming 19 startups for the past three months, and I'm so excited to have you all hear more about who they are and what they're working on. So let's get to it. Um, I'm excited to kick off our pitches with the first startup, Patch AI. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alessandro Monterosso, co-founder and CEO at Patch AI, the first virtual assistant for patient engagement. We are part of the Health Batch X at Plug and Play in Silicon Valley. At Patch AI, we want to transform clinical research and drug development process, but also standard clinical practice by a virtual focus on patient centricity in order to help pharma produce better, affordable, and personalized drugs and also improve the quality of life of, pa of patients. But what do we do? We do engage patients and collect health available data in real time. Why do we do it? We all have seen during the COVID emergency that healthcare systems are burdened. But more specifically, we've seen the problems into the drug development process that are more complex and inefficiencies than ever. One out of 5,000 molecules reaches the market in 15 years, and it costs more than 2 billion per every single molecule. During this period, clinical studies are conducted to test the drug. And here we experience low patient engagement. That is nothing else than their proactive collaboration during studies. This brings to high rates of dropouts, low therapy adherence, and huge available healthcare costs. Also, pharma companies are looking to uh, bring to the market precision uh, drugs. And in order to do so, they need to collect real world data beyond the pill. That's why we have seen a surge into the collection of patient reported outcomes. That's why we say bye bye to the electronic solutions and we enter the conversational patient reported outcomes. Patch AI is the first virtual assistant that mimics human conversation, chatting with patients like a friend will do on WhatsApp. Our uh, empathetic chatbots chat with patients, uh, reminding them to take their therapy as prescribed, ensuring high level of retention and the engagement throughout the clinical trial journey, as well as, as the uh, clinical pathway in the standard clinical practice. Gamification services, as well as a, um, a dashboard to help them uh, comply uh, with the, uh, the to-do list, uh, statistics, and education on demand. All these data are available for uh, researchers, doctors, but also uh, CROs and pharma companies in real time. We are a medical device class one and we're compliant with the regulations of the niche market we are targeting. In only 18 months from incorporation, we gathered two out of the, uh, out of the uh, five top pharma companies in the globe as clients and uh, signed partnership with the uh, interesting corporates. Every year, there are more than 22,000 new clinical studies globally and over 1,000 pharma companies that we can target. Our engagement engine works by collecting data from patients' behavior and health statuses and implement personalized engagement strategies via conversations. During the COVID emergencies, 
we have seen a surge into the demand, but also the need for new solutions into the standard clinical practice. That's why we in increased uh, our offering by uh, targeting pharma with the new value proposition, patient support programs. And we also added two additional features, video consultations and COVID modules that allows patients uh, to self-triage for COVID symptoms. We do target pharma companies that pays us around 50 euro per patient per month and we offer our solution for free to doctors and patients. Why we're better than others? We do customize for every single pharma companies, but we reach an individual uh, level of personalization thanks to machine learning. So after the study initiates, every single patient will have his or her own Petra AI. We are a team of doctors, nurses, scientists, and tech nerds. What do we want to take from this market? We want to gather around 80 projects in order to uh, take revenues for 32 million in around four years. Are we truly engaging patients? We can say yes. During the first four months of 2020, uh, patients using Patch AI are compliant on over 95% of uh, the cases. Also, during the COVID uh, emergency, we welcomed Smart Health Companion, the first patient support program of Roche, um, powered and offered by Patch AI. Now we are also uh, fundraising and we're looking for 1.7 million to bridge till the Series A uh, foreseen in 2021 and half of it has been committed by new investors. Don't wait. Enter with us the new era of data collection with patient engagement at every step. Thank you for the attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Alessandro. So up next we have RxL. Hi everyone, my name is Amy Cal, and I am co-founder as well as Chief Marketing Officer of RxAll, which is a instant um, drug testing platform. And our product is actually showcased here in the virtual background behind me. Um, I'm just going to take a quick second right now to share my screen so you can see my pitch presentation. Here we go. And I'm also going to turn on my timer to make sure that I finish in time. So, all right, let's get started. So, um, as mentioned earlier, RxL is really tackling the fake drug industry. Over 1 million people die from counterfeit medicine each and every year. I myself am a victim of fake medicine and luckily um, I've been really fortunate to survive um, the health crisis, but millions of people across the world unfortunately aren't afforded a second opportunity. The main question that we're really trying to answer and provide a solution for is how big pharma can protect their products and patients while showing real-time data about where the counterfeit medicine actually shows up in the world. And so our solution does this through four steps. Um, so just a little bit about the platform itself. It's an AI hyperspectral platform that helps to determine the quality of drug and it does this in under 30 seconds using just the phone as well as the IoT nano scanner. So in this process, the test sample is not destroyed and there is also no need to prep that sample. So how it works is you place the drug on the lens of the nano scanner and then you pair then the app on the phone, the RxL app to the phone. Um, this, is, this can be done through Bluetooth as well as scan. Um, the device then sends the drug spectra to our mobile app and in the mobile app, um, it then sends the spectra to our cloud where our artificial intelligence comes pairs that um, spectral signature from that drug scan to the reference database that um, is stored so they can identify the deviations and um, see whether or not the drug is counterfeit. In step four, the AI sends the test results to our mobile app confirming the identity of the drug and its quality. And essentially, uh, as a customer on the back end, you'll receive a notification informing you um, whether or not the drug that you've just tested is real or fake. Now, there's a variety of solutions offered in this field, but our solution is primarily different um, because it allows for real-time intelligence about where poor quality drugs are showing up and which batches and brands are affected. 
And here is a view of our heat map. Um, and this pretty much um, provides real time information that allows big pharmas to know where the bad drugs are uh, actually showing up. So um, they're able to track and trace um, and identify and have awareness that there's um, counterfeiters out there selling their brand. Now, um, we sell hardware prescription subscriptions as a service to pharmacies, hospitals, and FDAs. Uh, that is our initial uh, target niche business model. So we're very much uh, B2B currently. And um, we are currently fundraising um, $1 million to help us continue building out our tech platform, um, acquire talent, as well as customers. And we already have a lot of traction with um, different purchase orders from large pharmaceutical companies. And um, AstraZeneca is actually one of our recent uh, key studies. Um, they're one of our recent customers, and we're really helping them with real-time drug authentication. Uh, since our commercial launch in October 2018, we've received orders from across the world for more than a thousand units. And from a numbers perspective, um, currently we are on track for a $2.5 million ARR um, by the end of this year. And we also have a really strong sales pipeline lead for over 7,000 units. This is our team. Uh, we pretty much met each other uh, while we were all pursuing our master's university, uh, master's degree, excuse me, at Yale University. And uh, together we have over 20 years of combined experience in the pharmaceutical industry, delivering over $100 million um, in projects uh, for large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we're already making a great impact um, across the world. So we hope that you will join us on this journey and help us to save uh, lives globally across the world. I think that brings us exactly at four minutes. So thank you so much for your time. And um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to myself um, or visit our website, which is www.rxall.net. And you can also find it on the uh, right hand corner of the upper right hand corner of our slide deck. Thank you. And um, thank you for listening. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Great. So up next, we have Talak Healthcare. Hi, everyone. My name is Edouard, and I'm the co-founder of Talak Healthcare, a startup based in Paris and San Francisco. For more than 10 years, I've been producing video games at a leading mobile game publisher called Gameloft. And I have witnessed front row how much mobile video games can reach, retain, and engage millions of users over a long period of time. Figures don't lie, there are 2.6 billion people playing video games regularly around the world. At TILAC, we're, user that, we're using that power of retention and engagement to help solve one of the biggest issues that current healthcare systems are facing, which is how can we more efficiently manage patients affected by chronic diseases? So we create highly engaging, clinically validated medical mobile games to help monitor and rehabilitate patients affected by chronic diseases. You play, we care. Those games are recommended by doctors. Patients download them on their smartphone or tablet, and clinical data is retrieved and sent back to the physician on a web-based dashboard. To build those games, we created a unique video game studio composed of seasoned gaming professionals and medical experts. And we first started with ophthalmology, and more specifically, targeted patients affected by chronic eye disease of aging, like AMD or diabetic retinopathy, which are the leading cause of blindness in the world, with around 217 million people affected. Those diseases can be treated and slowed down by injecting anti-VGF injection in the eyes, like lucentisphilia, provided that we do regular visual assessments to identify changes in vision early. Unfortunately, due to a shortage of specialists, it's almost impossible to detect those changes in real time. So we created Odyssey, which is the first medical mobile game to monitor your vision. The game is composed of clinically validated medical modules to track your visual parameters, like visual acuity and a puzzle game also, to train the visual memory and engage the patient in a fun and compelling experience. So doctors recommend Odyssey, patients play on their smartphone, and the information goes back to the doctor on a web-based dashboard. If a change in vision is detected in the game, both doctor and patient receive a notification to trigger a control vision, visit, and if needed, proceed to treatment. We started deploying the solution in September 2018, 
in France, once we got our CE mark as a medical device, pretty fast, we really realized it was efficient for both patients and doctors. Other site empowers patients in a unique way. Today, our retention rate is comparable to Instagram, with patients coming back on average every 2.7 days. Impressive given the fact that the average age of our patients is 70 years old. To expand our user base and deploy the solution faster, we signed an exclusive co-promotion deal in France with Novartis, which allows us today to be used by more than 150 retinal specialists in France, and they have recommended the app to more than 1,800 patients. But what we are the most proud of is obviously the impact of the patient's life. Our site is already helping saving lives. And the recent COVID crisis has reinforced our value proposition. The game helped monitor patients during lockdown. And here is the powerful example of Madame R, a 73-year-old woman treated for wet AMD on her left eye since July 2019. During the lockdown phase, she and her doctor received an alert regarding a vision loss on her right untreated eye. She was immediately seen by her doctor who performed an injection. And her next appointment was scheduled for a month later and she could have lost her second eye. We have dozens of cases like this. So for us, the next steps are pretty clear. We are raising 10 million euros to expand and diversify, expand in ophthalmology and internationally to bring Odyssey to more patients, but diversify also to apply medical gaming to other types of patients. We have already started the prototyping of our second game in collaboration with Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston to prevent people affected by opioid addiction from relapsing. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, thank you for the presentation. So up next, we have another portfolio company, um, Bold Health. Hi, we're Bold Health and we develop digital therapies for the management of chronic digestive conditions, leveraging behavioral medicine. 74% of Americans have some form of digestive discomfort, which leads to a large medical spend of about $140 billion annually. Yet the outcomes for sufferers are poor. Whereas we might have drugs for the physical symptoms, we often don't tackle the root causes of illness, such as psychological factors, lifestyle, or behaviors. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome is uh, the first condition we're tackling. Uh, IBS is the most commonly diagnosed digestive condition and it's highly linked to stress. About 30 million Americans suffer with IBS and the majority of those have depression and anxiety. IBS is a very disabling condition, but we have few treatment options that work. But there is something that works, that's behavioral medicine. Techniques such as cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnotherapy achieve over 70% efficacy rates, uh, and they're included in care guidelines. However, they're only available offline, and there's very few therapists able to provide them. So the only way to access them at scale would be digitally. So we went to a number of experts in gastroenterology, digital health, uh, and clinical psychology, um, from the United States and Europe to create our first product called Zemedy, which is the world's first digital therapeutic program for IBS based on cognitive behavioral therapy. And it was created in close collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania. Zemedy has a conversational interface whereby a friendly chatbot L takes the patient through their care journey, which includes weekly CBT lessons and daily exercises for symptom relief, such as progressive muscle relaxation. And Zemedy works. We have close to 10,000 users so far, all organic, who are getting great results. They're relieving symptoms, they love the interface, and for the first time, they are getting support with their psychological factors of illness in addition to physical symptoms. We've also proven these results in a clinical trial with UPenn, uh, where majority of patients are responding positively, uh, reducing symptoms significantly. We also know from our program completers in the beta that they achieve 73% uh, reduction in IBS severity on average. So that leads to benefits across the care continuum in IBS. Patients get sustained results, their employers get a more productive workforce, payers get reduction in medical spend, uh, and the medical system as a whole benefits by relieving capacity uh, while uh, patients remote care um, with a, a digital solution. 
Therefore, we can sell B2C direct to patient um, in subscription in the App Store, but our focus will be on B2B, selling into employers and insurers. And IBS is just the beginning. We are looking at building products in a variety of digestive conditions, such as IBD and GERD. Uh, we, are, we are also looking at other chronic digestive conditions that are linked to stress, such as psoriasis. Our team is passionate about um, empowering patients to self-care and self-treat. I have been a sufferer myself of IBS and other digestive uh, issues and I've spent time in venture capital investing in digital health and learning the ropes. My co-founder is a medical doctor and serial entrepreneur in digital health, and together we put uh, a team uh, with complementary talent in technology, research, and clinical. Right here, we are looking for employer deployments uh, and commercial partnerships, and we're also raising our seed round of $2.25 million a third of which is already committed uh, with uh, a, C a VC on board um, called Seedling Health. Uh, so if any of this was interesting, please uh, let us know. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Elena. Um, so up next, we have Caribbean Systems. Hi everybody, I'm Maddie Hersfeld. I'm the CEO here at Caravine, and we're so grateful to be included in this plug and play batch. So a little bit about CareVive. So we're building technology to improve cancer patient outcomes um, at lower costs. We believe we're the only ones on the market that are the most holistic EHR integrated cancer care management platform, really enabling providers to provide patient-centered care from diagnosis through end of life. And we have demonstrated our outcomes in over 60 scientific presentations and oncology meetings and publications. And with 26 health systems under our belt, we're now able to offer CareVive opt-in where we can share with all the stakeholders in cancer care, real world cancer patient experiences. This is a list of our provider customers and our business partners. The CareVive Optin Network currently offers more than 50,000 patients, which represents more than 3% of the total cancer market in the U.S. We're currently offering registry data in multiple myeloma, ovarian, breast cancer, and lung cancer. We provide value across the stakeholders and life science companies. We provide commercial insights, such as what products are being used and how, differences between therapies, and reasons for switching and discontinuations. We inform new drug development and new indications by providing important data. We also support market access by tracking longitudinal outcome data and showing value across different indications. We are currently building the largest real-world cancer patient experience database. So some of our accomplishments to date, working with Plug and Play, it's been an incredible experience um, working with mentors around refining our go-to-market strategy for life science companies with input from Plug and Play themselves and Merck and Roche and Sanofi and Lilly. Um, we've also participated in a number of venture meetings to close out our Series C financing. And we have done a deep dive partnership discussion with Roche Diagnostics that we're really excited about. That opportunity um, with Roche Diagnostics on uh, Navify Tumor Board solution um, that this uh, plug and play led us to culminated in an all day long uh, workshop um, focused on um, understanding key pain points of our end users and synergies and opportunities for solutions. Um, we identified key areas where a collaborative solution could really offer added value to both our patients and providers. The first being bringing that patient voice into the decision-making process by integrating patient-reported outcomes data collected by CareVive to enrich the tumor board discussions supported by Navify to really enable true patient-centered treatment decisions. The second opportunity for added value was around streamlining workflows and saving time by reducing manual or redundant data entry through integrating key clinical data that's central to both platforms. What this looks like in a tangible, real-world collaborative workflow um, would mean a patient being enrolled into the CareVive prompt application at the time of initial diagnosis and collection of those key treatment decision-making PROs 
such as a patient's frailty index, their functional status, or their preferences around treatment. Integrating that information and incorporating it into the Navify Tumor Board solution to support that improved patient-centered treatment decision process. Then coming out of that, integrating the clinical data and that ultimate treatment decision from the Mapify Tumor Board solution back to CareVive to drive that truly personalized patient-facing treatment care plan. Thanks so much, Kip. Plug and play for having us. We had a blast and it was so helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, CareVive team. It was wonderful having you guys a part of the program as well. Um, so up next, we have POPs Virtual Care. Hi, I'm Lonnie Starmo, 30-year Medtronic veteran, co-founder and CEO of POPs. POPs is about flipping healthcare on its head and enabling people to own their own condition using technology. First, let's back up. 60% of us are living with a chronic condition and diabetes is the most expensive one. Why? Well, let's look at it from a person like myself living with diabetes. While clinics do their best to get quality outcomes, we're out spending our time living our life, not in the clinic. And the primary tool that we've been given, those glucose test kits, are usually not with us. POPs changes that experience. With a platform centered around MENA, your AI virtual coach, paired along with the simplest way to measure blood sugar on the market, the POPs rubble meter. I wanna show you a video. The first part is that traditional glucose test kit and how clunky it is. And then we switch to POPs. You see how easy it is for the person to get a blood sugar measurement without ever stop walking. And you see Mina throughout the video. Let's take a look. kind of fast. So I want to give you a live demo by switching that traditional test kit and how it's five times larger than the POPs rebel meter. If I slide that out of the way, if I want to check my blood sugar with POPs, I simply hit check, slide open the cover, it's creating a Bluetooth connection to the phone, and it's telling me to use the second of the three tests that are in this module. I do that simply like this, place that blood sample, close my cover, and I get a result on the phone. It's that easy. So now clinics can extend care outside their walls by offering the POPs digital service to be that companion with the person with diabetes while they're living their life. We're different than the other solutions that are out there because we have that simpler rebel meter versus the traditional kit, and we have Mina, your virtual coach, versus the live coachings which might confuse patients. Who's taking care of them? Your healthcare professionals or the live coach of a company? In clinical studies, we've shown a one point drop in A1C, 100% first time use, and 100% accurate to the FDA standards. And in our first healthcare system pilot, a 75% net promoter score, and this clinic was able to use the CPT code to get reimbursed for this service. So in this way, this opportunity is to generate new revenue with this reimbursement code, improve care, a marketing differentiation, and importantly, you don't have to change the workflow of your clinic. POPs does the work. From an investor perspective, we did close a Series A last year. Because of COVID virus, we changed our strategy and we decided to extend that Series A and plan to close $2 million next quarter. Please, if you see that healthcare is moving to the point where people own their own life using technology platform, we would love to talk to you more. Wonderful, thanks Lonnie. And it was great to have POPs as part of the program as well. Um, so up next uh, is Life365. Hi, I'm Kent Dix, co-founder and CEO of Life365. Although Life365 is a B2B2C play, 
Our mission is to solve our clients' friction points in scaling their operation to patients at home and beyond. Our team are no strangers to success. We are award-winning and have major partnerships with Mayo Clinic, Plug and Play, AMR Ambulance, Osong Healthcare, and many others. We started production Q4 2019 and now executing on a pipeline of over 3 million with a current ARR of 1.8 million. We have also been awarded strategic patents in the next generation of intelligent wearables, patches, and sensors. Serial entrepreneurs with over 60 years of experience in digital health and gamification, we have several exits amongst us, including an exit to Allier Abbott with 430x revenue. Market conditions have aligned to once again allow us to create another successful company in digital health. Our team has been instrumental in disrupting and bridging that gap, creating one of the first IoT of healthcare, RPM 2.0, and now enabling the scaling to much greater population of patients through light, disposable, cost-effective wearables, patches, and sensors. For the past 15 years, digital health solutions have been trying to bridge the chasm between patient and provider, disparately and unsuccessfully. There's no single point of connection, it's not personalized, and it's extremely expensive and not scalable. Our mission is to create a virtual care platform that bundles and integrates digital health solutions on a commonly curated platform, solving the problem in connecting patients remotely at home. Life 365 removes the friction points for scaling connected solutions to home, including integration into clinical backend, alignment of the right solutions, distribution, and engagement. The virtual care platform highly personalizes and bundles solutions specific to engage patients in their own care. Life 365 is specifically focusing on COVID-19 at this particular point, bundling assessment tools, COVID-19 testing, Life 365's edge, edge sensor technology, connecting, shipping, and monitoring of COVID-19 patients to keep them out of the ER hospital to reduce demand on the healthcare system. Life 365 has partnered with a major tech company to provide a variety of COVID-19 kits that connect patients to their healthcare providers and to help ensure employees can return back to work safely. A variety of use cases have been developed to align the COVID-19 kits solution with patients, including self-quarantine, early discharge, prevention uh, assessment, chronic care, and clinical trials. We have partnered with service providers like Avicenna, Blue Star Senior Tech, and AMR Ambulance to help assess and monitor remotely. Our True Edge, highly personalized solutions across a large population of patients. Our secret sauce is our patent portfolio. We have five patents and 14 more pending around a line of wearables and devices that will take connected healthcare to the next level. This has already generated great interest with large payers, and we're uh, currently raising our five to eight million dollars million dollar Series A to scale our current operations while developing our next gen. One solution doesn't fit all. It's all about engaging the patient on their terms, whether a millennial or a senior. We have the connected solution that engages on a consumer's terms, seamlessly connected to the clinical back end. We look forward to leading the digital health revolution, whose time is finally here with our latest venture. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kent. You guys are working on some pretty great stuff. So up next, we have a startup um, that was previously actually called Unison Migraine, and they've recently changed their name to Juva Health. So let's give it up for Juva Health. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. My name is Herbert Ong. I'm the CEO of Juva Health. We were formerly known as Unison. So we've developed a smartphone-based biofeedback app that is a treatment for serious health conditions. <clears throat> We're gonna start first with migraine, other chronic pain and stress, but this can be applied to a number of other conditions in the future. <clears throat> so four years ago when I was helping my mother deal with her episodic migraines, I stumbled upon this treatment modality called biofeedback. It turns out it's a well-established treatment that is provided by many hospitals and has been proven with hundreds of studies to be as effective as medication, not only for migraine, but for nine different health conditions. So I just knew that at some point, all of these instruments can and will be replaced by mobile phone sensors. 
So the way it works is a clinician will teach you techniques on how to voluntarily control bodily functions that you normally can't control. So things like your heart rate, your skin temperature, muscle tensions, and others. Problem is, biofeedback requires visits to hospital clinics, you need to be hooked up to wires and instruments, and it's expensive. So it's not truly an option for most patients. But it is effective though. These um, hospitals and many others actually offer biofeedback clinics today, and these insurance carriers and others reimburse for this treatment for select conditions. So the good news is that the technology of what's inside our mobile phones has advanced enough that we can actually um, replicate what's happening in those clinics. We've developed a smartphone-based biofeedback app, and we're gonna tackle migraine and headaches first because it's the third most common condition in the world. It's actually more than diabetes, asthma, and epilepsy combined. Basically, you just settle down in a quiet spot, uh, position the phone so that the camera's capturing your face, and you can even close your eyes. While the app is tracking your biometrics, you will hear guided audio from licensed therapists with proven exercises to move you from that sympathetic stress state to a parasympathetic relaxed state. So using just a video camera on your phone, we can now track your heart rate. And from that, we're also able to capture your heart rate variability, your blood volume pulse, all as effective as an Apple Watch, by the way. We're also able to track your respiration rate. And we're now working on micro expressions of the face that will allow us to develop an objective measure of pain. And optionally, if you use our custom finger device, we can also track your finger temperature and galvanic skin response, which is exactly what lie detectors are using. So the goal of the app is to replicate all um, the therapies that are provided today in the clinic. Since this is designed to manage a disease, patients will be using the app to track the progress over time and will be doing continued practice to report to the doctors. We're doing a soft launch of the app next month and we'll be charging patients directly. So we've already established partnerships with these healthcare systems. Hartford Healthcare sees over 2,000 patients per month and we'll start to prescribe and recommend our app to their patients beginning July. Up next is Yale, who's, who sees 1,000 patients per month. A number of others have asked to be on our list as well, including Mayo Clinic, Scripps, Diamond Headed Clinics across the US. So we have a very unique ability to do what I call dynamic therapy. This is where audio clips can be inserted in real time to super personalize clinical therapy. The content can actually adapt in real time because we're tracking your biometrics in real time. We don't actually think this has been done before. In addition to all this, we, we are, because we're capturing the video of the patient's face every time they use the app, we have the unique ability to apply machine learning and AI to get better and better over time. What's interesting about migraine is that it's the number one reason for avoidable emergency room visits, and it's one of the top reasons for employees calling in sick at work. So because of that, treating patients with our app has multiple benefits, whether you're a hospital, insurance carrier, or self-insured employer. This tech can be helpful for a number of conditions beyond migraine, um, pain and stress. And our team, all of us in our team have deep healthcare backgrounds. I'm a two-time startup founder. Phil is a developer, is also a data scientist, and Dr. Buse is a nationally recognized headache expert. And our other developers are from MIT, Harvard, with the video imaging expertise. So if there's one thing for you to rem remember today, it's you know, we're digital therapeutic, that is considered to be as effective as medication. If you'd like to see a live demo, please reach out to me. I'd love to meet you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Wonderful, thank you, Herbert. So up next, we have a startup called Suggestic. At Suggestic, we have built a mobile development platform. It empowers businesses around the world to publish personalized nutrition apps. We have more information about ourselves than ever before. I've tested my body for everything, genome, microbiome, glycemic response, food sensitivities, you name it. However, I struggle immensely when I need to decide what I should cook or what I should order at a restaurant or what to buy at the grocery store. We all need guidance. With over 100,000 books on nutrition and thousands of lab tests and devices, it is difficult to find the right experts to personalize our dietary programs. We need convenience. With online home delivery, our number of nutrition options have exploded, but that also makes it much more difficult to find the right food. At Suggestic, our main insight was that to allow people to engage with personalized nutrition, we needed to make it super easy and convenient to find delicious, affordable, and healthy foods. And that this was a data and discovery problem that we could solve. 
We realized that if we could use data and artificial intelligence to match what our body needs with the food we like the most, and then further match to the food options around us, we could effectively allow for food to become medicine. And already 80% of consumers want food to be medicine. But for, to allow for this to happen, we need mobile apps to help us discover the most convenient foods available based on our personalized dietary needs. As the healthcare, wellness, food, and nutrition industries collide, they have given birth to 60,000 nutrition-related app publishers. Everyone from health plans to fitness and from lab tests to supplement companies all want their own app. And the problem is health apps take over 24 months to develop and cost over a million dollars, and most of them fail to meet consumer expectations. Suggestix developer platform empowers businesses to create dietary programs personalized to each body needs, customize consumer preferences, suggest, deliver food, track user progress, continuously improve suggestions. As an expert, you create personalized programs by encoding dietary rule sets, including video guidance, and incorporating your own products and services such as lab test devices, coaching, supplements, or food. Our customer programs can then be personalized and customized through assessments, lab tests, devices, dietitians, and each customer app can then integrate meal planners, recipe finders, grocery lists, food login, restaurant menus, food delivery, and many other modules and functionality. And well, if that were not enough, if you happen to be sitting at a restaurant, you can take out your phone, point it at the menu, and have any of the suggested apps overlay your top rated menu options. Super easy and actionable. Partners like Biom Health can use all this technology to create their own app, and within it, have a single dietary program meant to rebalance your gut. This program includes a microbiome test, coaching, and their own line of probiotics. On the other side, United Healthcare can also create an app, but instead of creating their own programs, they decide to distribute multiple partner offerings, including Biome Health's gut rebalance and microbiome program. In that way, our solution helps partners easily build beautiful and powerful apps. It also allows partners to create personalizable programs that bundle with your own diagnostic and nutrition offerings. And finally, our technology platform empowers them all to incorporate advanced functionality and the most comprehensive data sources. So instead of two years of development time, partners receive a fully functional app in as little as one day. And instead of millions of dollars of development costs, they pay only for success. They pay for engagement, and they pay for sales. Our success-based revenue model allows app publishers to pay a monthly fee for each active user, and for program creators, we charge them a commission on sales of their program, their products, and their services. And since we pivoted in November, this revenue model allowed us to close over $5.5 million in contracts with 1.9 million in ARR. And this is in addition to having almost 10 million more in the final contracting stage out of 61 qualified opportunities in our pipeline from the healthcare, wellness, fitness, and food industries. And all of them are interested because Suggestic has the only solution that provides an entire suite of data, functionality, personalization, and AR. But most importantly, we have created a unique marketplace of partner programs that can filter and score for every single type of food and nutrition product. And unlike other nutrition companies, we do not compete with program creators, app publishers, clinics, gyms, coaches, or dietitians. We actually empower them to reach their end users. In this mutually exclusive and sustainably fragmented marketplace, we provide all of the actors with tools to make a difference. Together, we can make food as medicine a reality, and with it, empower billions of people around the world to live healthier, happier, and longer lives. Awesome, thank you. You guys are working on some really cool stuff. Great, so up next we have Sway Medical. Hi, I'm Chase Curtis, CEO and founder at Sway Medical. At Sway, we're completely changing the way that people do mobile neurological assessment. 
Traditionally, neurological assessments have been done using pen and paper and with highly specialized clinicians who are actually performing those assessments. More recent assessments have been moved to digital platforms such as mobile devices and tablets, but they have inherent limitations in how that hard work can accurately measure the cognitive response and other measures like simple reaction time. So the capacitive touch of a mobile device is constantly scanning to see when a touch event occurs, but there's inherent latency in that timing. Anywhere from 40 to 90 milliseconds of latency can occur simply from the hardware itself not being able to accurately detect when a touch event has occurred. Sway makes neurological assessment both objective, accessible, and accurate using the motion sensors of the device and not the touch screen. So how does that work? So we use the accelerometer that's built into any mobile device or tablet, iPhone or Android, to get consistency across both platforms. That means the test scores are not different from an iPad to a Samsung or Google device. Now, if we look at the actual breakdown of the timing implementations to make these measures, with motion, we can get down to accuracy of under 10 milliseconds. That's about 2 to 5% error compared to high-speed camera as a gold standard. Now, if you think about touchscreen implementations, research has shown that touchscreen implementations have anywhere from 40 to 90 milliseconds of variable latency. Now, if you think about somebody's simple reaction time being 200 to 300 milliseconds, 90 milliseconds is a substantial amount of error anywhere from 20 to 50% error on that individual, and you just can't get accurate measures of cognitive function like simple reaction time. Now, the current test that we have in the Sway platform, we have a balance test where you hold the device against the chest, that's patented, we have a memory test, we have a reaction time test that's built on the patented motion sensor measures, inspection time that's looking at visual processing speed, and impulse control that's based on the same concept as reaction time, just with some slightly different variables. So we have a highly accurate platform where we're looking at a multimodal assessment of somebody's overall neurological function, both motor and cognitive. Now we have over 50 published research studies working with leading institutions all across the country to get reliability, validity, and really accurate measures to show that Sway is a great platform for assessing these variables. Now these are huge markets. We have both a sports medicine market, a work impairment market, and a chronic neuro disease market that's looking at things like Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and Parkinson's, and other chronic neurological diseases. And these markets are incredibly large and growing rapidly. Now Sway, uh, as a company, we're an established brand in the sports medicine business. Uh, we have existing revenue selling to colleges, high schools, and sports medicine clinics. We're a MDSAP certified and medical device that's cleared in the US, Australia, the European Union, and Canada. And we're just rolling out with our workforce impairment product, as well as building on existing research that shows that these measures can be really useful in evaluating chronic neurological conditions. Now we have a great team. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of the company. We have a great software lead. Uh, we have a great team in both the sports medicine space, uh, as well as just understanding technology and how to bring this product to market. Now we have these three key markets that we're addressing right now. In the sports medicine market, we're building upon our existing revenue and showing continual growth in that market. We're just rolling out our workforce impairment market with large companies to begin to do impairment and readiness for work testing. And we're really kicking off on our 18 month R&D effort to show uh, validity and sensitivity and specificity within the chronic neurological condition space. Now to wrap up our funding status, we're currently uh, finalizing our Series A round of funding that we hope to have wrapped up here in the next two to three weeks. Uh, and we hope that you reach out and learn more about Sway. Thank you. Awesome, exciting stuff. Thanks, Chase. Um, so up next, we have Vision App. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Matt from Vision App, and I'm happy to share with you this company progress after three months with Plug and Play. One in two people will be a myope by year 2050 unless we can prevent it. Myopia affects children because their eyes are still growing. It is not only genetics. Bad digital habits can make it far worse. It is not only aesthetics because myopia can cause pathologies, such as retinal lesions, maculopathy, retinal detachment and even blindness. That's why at Vision App we developed Myopia App Eye Protection an app that teaches you how to maintain healthy face device distances. It also teaches you healthy daily light levels. And finally, it teaches you how to keep healthy screen time limits. It's an app that's available for parents, optometrists and eye doctors. Eye protection for the whole family. Let your device care for your eyes with Myopia app Eye Protection. Let me tell you about our team. 
Vision App was founded by researchers and academics at what we like to call an intersection between clinical optometry and vision science. This knowledge is augmented by technology and business experts from Capital Certainty, who have reached over 1 million in recurring revenue from their multiple social-oriented ventures. Currently, building upon our strong scientific base, we are adding verticals to our platform through interdisciplinary eye research. We add excellent peers to our platform and earn know-how and from forty to $200,000 from projects. We are building a vision platform for value-based medicine. In the six months since the launch of our first product, Myopia App, we have collected over 500 million points of behavioral data. We aim to collect over 20 billion by the end of the fourth quarter of this year and create the largest database of vision habits. Ultimately, our goal is to create a lifelong companion app and a remote, AI-powered eye health supervision platform for eye care professionals, so that we can all let our devices care for our eyes. I am happy to share that we have teamed up with Align Athelou Spain. Vision app will receive 5,000 euros of monthly license fees. Our Myopia app will be recommended by opticians in over 330 stores. And to kick off the collaboration, Vision app received approximately 200,000 euros in cash and manpower. Our business model is simple, yet, importantly, in line with the needs of the eye care professionals. Children receive our Myopia app eye protection. Their parents can keep track of their children's digital habits and eye care professionals receive a first-of-the-kind solution to remotely supervise their young patients. Our recent product launch in Spain was accompanied by a press conference, with most of the important media outlets present. So far, our iterative and focused user acquisition campaigns resulted in over 50,000 downloads of Myopia app. We are pleased to have reached a presentable 9 cents per user acquisition cost, which we are still working on improving. Furthermore, in May, we have launched a research study with Myopia app used by children under quarantine, which is called COVID Vision. It is a first-of-a-kind research study to help scientists learn the digital habits of children confined at home all day. 500 children will participate in the study, coordinated by six research groups from Spain's universities of Murcia, Alicante and Madrid, and led by top vision scientists, some of which are Vision App partners. Thank you so much for tuning in and for your interest in Vision App. If you would like more information, please drop me an email at matt at visionapp.org or reach out through one of our social networks. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Um, so very quickly, before we go into the next startup, I just wanted to send a quick reminder um, that if you have any questions for the startups or if you want to connect with the startups directly, um, to do so through our networking app called Brella. So I went ahead and included the link in the chat feature down below. So make sure to register and create a profile and uh, set up one-on-one -on -one meetings or chat directly with the startups that you're seeing today. Great, so with that, up next we have Ferrum Health. This is actually a company that just recently closed their Series A round, so congrats. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Brill, and I'm with Ferrum Health. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the world. We've spent the last two years revolutionizing patient safety. We've had great success across the globe. We're implemented in six different countries, including the US. I'll speak more to this in just a bit. What we do is we are seeking to eliminate medical errors across the continuum of patient care, across the entire patient journey, from identifying at-risk patients before they know they need to come into the health system, to helping to eliminate diagnostic errors, to ensuring that proper follow-up occurs once a patient discharges from the health system. I'm going to spoke, focus on a specific area right now, and that is in the diagnostic error arena. So what happens today in radiology is a radiologist will interpret a study and they will dictate a report. It is known that this is a super complex environment and that mistakes get made, things get overlooked in this fast-paced environment. 
So Jaco recommends that 5% of these studies get peer reviewed by another radiologist to try and make sure that things don't get missed. It's a fairly ineffective method. Ferrum takes it to the next level. What Ferrum does is we review 100% of the applicable studies. We use machine vision to look for abnormalities. Where we find an abnormality, in this case, we're looking at CTs of the lung and we're looking for nodules. Where we find one, we highlight it and annotate it. Then we look at the dictated report to see if it's present, if, the men if it is mentioned in the report. And as you can see here, it is not mentioned. Where we do not have a mention of an abnormality that we find, we flag it for review. A reviewing radiologist will then take a look and if they agree that it is a miss, send it back to the interpreting radiologist for a second view and an addendum. We're more than just a CT lung nodule tool though. We are a platform that deploys behind the firewall, enabling health systems to keep their PHI within the health system. We develop in three different areas. We have algorithms that Ferrum has developed like the one I just mentioned. We have third-party algorithms that are commercially available and ready today to be deployed. And an example of those would be a pulmonary embolism tool, a mammogram tool, chest x-ray tool, and a fracture detection tool. And then we have research and co-development opportunities. Many of our health systems have specific use cases that they want to co-develop on. So we are currently working with our health system partners in these areas that you can see. Here's an example of one of our health systems, Sutter Health out in the West Coast. In a six month period, we ran 23,000 CT studies and detected 179 missed lung nodules. 105 of those were deemed significant misses. When you extrapolate out, this means that we will have early detected 15 cancers in one year. This is only on a portion of the health system's volume. 15 cancers detected early saves lives. When you detect a stage one cancer, lung cancer, five-year survivability is over 60%. If you miss it in the early stages and you detect it later and you pick it up at stage four, two years later, that five-year survivability plunges to a single digit. This is a quote from Dr. Wiesner, who's very pleased with what we've been doing. And he believes that in this busy environment, tools like Ferrum provide a critical role in providing a safety net to the radiologist so they can do a more effective job. We'd like to work with you and your health system and we look forward to that day. Wonderful, thank you to the Ferrum team. So up next, we have a startup that translates lifestyle and wearable data into actionable insights. So welcome, HealthSnap. Hello everyone, my name is Samson Maggot. I'm the co-founder and chief business development officer for HealthSnap. Right now, we live in a chronic care economy where over 90% of all healthcare expenditures are tied directly to preventable lifestyle related chronic disease. One can say that our current healthcare delivery model is actually more of a disease care model where we treat the symptoms of chronic condi conditions instead of preventing them from happening in the first place. The way that healthcare providers today is fundamentally changing. Over 80% of healthcare providers are actively investing in remote patient monitoring technology. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services developed new reimbursement models to incentivize healthcare providers to manage chronic conditions remotely, uh, up to almost $2,000 per patient per year. And if there is a silver lining of the global health crisis, it's that the acceleration of adoption for remote healthcare technology has increased significantly from both providers and more importantly, from patients. Unfortunately, existing tools just aren't designed to make virtual chronic disease management simple and profitable. Electronic medical records and existing healthcare tools collect data at one point in time and provide only a snapshot of that patient's chronic condition or health. Even if a healthcare provider did start looking at remote, uh, remotely generated health data or patient generated health data, 
it's overload for them and it becomes actually noise instead of uh, beneficial into uh, changing care plans or changing patient behaviors um, because it's not analyzed. Uh, and lastly, uh, the nuances and the novelty of a new reimbursement code set um, creates complexity in actually building properly, uh, more importantly, scaling a remote monitoring program uh, to make it profitable to thousands, for thousands of patients. And that's where HealthSnap comes in. We make remote patient monitoring uh, proactive and remote healthcare delivery simple and scalable. We've developed algorithms over three years of research at the University of Miami to transform raw patient-generated health data into personalized and actionable insights for both patients and providers. And we have patent pending technology that maximizes the reimbursement and documentation for the new remote patient monitoring CPT codes. Our secret sauce is that we combine a disease and device technology platform that's designed for virtual chronic disease management with our remote care services that remove the burden of actually enrolling patients in a monitoring program and more importantly, driving compliance. We integrate with all of the major connected health devices available on the market today. And our team of HealthSnap Angels provide a concierge level of service to patients that are enrolled in our programs and ensure that they stay compliant with either taking their blood pressure, a glucose reading, or staking, stepping on a scale daily um, as a part of their care plans. Since our commercial launch in January of 2020, we've seen ex explosive growth and adoption of our programs. We've signed four enterprise health systems, over 28 private physician groups, and three exciting strategic partnerships ranging in a diverse uh, markets from consumer goods to medical device and telehealth solutions. We've had some exciting key performance indicators over the last six months as well. And in just the last two weeks, we've received over 1,500 patient prescriptions, which accounts for an over 800% growth in the prescriptions that we've received month over month. We've gotten 84% of the patients that have been prescribed our program to actually opt in, which proves that there is patient demand and stickiness for a program like this. And over 70% of the patients that are actually enrolled and transmitting data to their providers become eligible for reimbursement, which shows that not only are patients opting in, but they're staying compliant and sticky to the program over time. HealthSnap's leadership team comes from a diverse background from healthcare experience um, to uh, starting early on with rapidly growing healthcare IT companies such as Athena Health. Um, our chief revenue officer and COO both come from Athena Health um, and, and rapidly growing revenue cycle companies. Um, we have former senior system engineers at, at Yahoo running our technology solutions and uh, leading experts in exercise science, nutrition, and behavioral science. Um, our chief scientific officer, Dr. Wesley Smith, is a leading PhD in those fields. HealthSnap is currently raising a Series A round, and we're looking and excited for the right partner to help us empower people living with chronic conditions anytime, anywhere. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Samson and the HealthSnap team. So up next, we have Lunit. They're tackling cancer through uh, an AI-powered imaging biomarker. Hello, everyone. I am Brandon. Um, I'm CEO of Lunit. Lunit is a well-established, one of the first generation medical AI companies in the world. It's a mission to conquer cancer through AI. Founded in 2013, uh, we have over 120 employees with operations in Korea, the US, uh, Europe, and China. We've been funded around 50 million so far from remarkable investors from Korea, Japan, and China, and the United States. Uh, and we've been featured in various major press such as uh, Forbes, Newsweek, and MIT Tech Review. We have a very strong AI foundation, which is one of the most remarkable aspects of our company. And our high-end deep learning technology has been recognized to be world leading in various competitions or be companies like Microsoft, Google, and IBM. We also have a very strong medical foundation, which has allowed us to collect and curate an unprecedented level of data in terms of scale and quality. Um, and this has led us uh, to develop a very highly accurate uh, AI. And our Products have been clinically validated in more than 40 studies, uh, which has been published in top peer reviewed journals like Radiology and Lancet Digital Health. Our mission is to conquer cancer, and we are doing this by revolutionizing how cancer is diagnosed and how cancer is treated by extracting actionable insights from various types of medical data um, that has not been possible before. 
And our diagnostic tools for chest X-ray mammography have been uh, demonstrated to be significantly better than that of radiologists in terms of the performance. And most importantly, uh, they have been clinically validated to significantly augment the performance level of the users. Uh, we've started to go commercial uh, with our products since a year ago, and we have uh, over 100 customers, uh, paying customers uh, uh, globally, um, scaling out rapidly. And the most remarkable aspect of our commercialization efforts is our partnership with uh, the major medical device vendors. Um, our products have been exclusively selected by various leading vendors as being best in class, and we'll be able to scale out our, scale, our sales through their global customer base, which covers around 60 to 70% of the total global market. Uh, and we are targeting to generate over 100 million in revenue within three to five years. In the treatment side, uh, we're developing a multi-omics platform to predict response to uh, treatment response uh, with a particular focus on pathology data, uh, clearly. Um, Lunitscope extracts features from pathology data that is highly predictive. The reason why we are particularly focused on tissue is to address the current trend in immuno-oncology. In immunotherapy, the analysis of uh, tumor's genomic profile, like NGS, is not really that important. It's what's surrounding the tumor called the tumor microenvironment that's really the key, uh, including the tumor uh, the immune phenotype. And we were one of the leading groups in using AI to comprehensively analyze tissue data. Our AI-based biomarkers have been demonstrated to be highly accurate in predicting response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, this particular um, study was um, conducted in lung cancer and has been published in last year's and this year's ASCO. Lunescope is significantly more accurate than pd one which is the current standard of care biomarker for lung cancer. Um, and then the implication of all this is Lunescope is, if it's used together with uh, pd one we can increase the number of patients that would receive and benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors by 50%, which is very significant for the patients as well as the biopharma companies. Uh, we're in the process of pr uh, productizing uh, Lunescope and getting to receive FDA approval by 2022. And in the meantime, collaborate with uh, biopharma companies to apply Lunescope in clinical trials. Um, our goal is to develop meaningful companion diagnostic tests that are paired with immunotherapy drugs, uh, having our AI applied to various types of tissue-related tests like H&E, uh, IHC, and multiplex IHC. Ultimately, we envision that our AI will be used uh, in every relevant medical data, both uh, for diagnosis as well as treatment decisions. And we're working hard to be the center of all this, uh, addressing a huge market of over uh, 50 billion. Thank you. Um, FYI, we, are, we have just uh, opened our Series 3 transfer round, and we will be happy to explore receiving investment from healthcare and biotech investors. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Brandon. So up next, we have another portfolio company. So uh, Lazarus uses patient data and deep learning to improve early detection of cervical cancer. So welcome, Lazarus. Imagine you go to your dermatologist to get a skin cancer screening. How accurate do you think they'll be? 70%, 80%, maybe 90? Well, according to a study by the US Preventive Task Force, dermatologists have a 49% sensitivity when it comes to screening for melanomas. How can this be? Well, it turns out screening for cancer is really hard because you have to turn information like this into this, actionable insights that they can use to save your life. They have to look at two moles that look like this, basically kind of look exactly the same to me, and say the one on the left is benign, the one on the right is malignant. Or is it the other way around? How do we prevent dermatologists from making mistakes like this? Well, how about we give them an AI assistant? Hi, I'm Ariel. We're Lazarus, and we help physicians catch cancer early. Using our model pre-trained on 330,000 images of moles, we give physicians this using just a single photo. A confidence score for how confident the model is for that specific result, a diagnosis or result uh, for what the presumptive diagnosis will probably be according to the model, and a color, green meaning good, yellow meaning ca be cautious, and red meaning biopsy this immediately. 
Also on top of that, we give them a full suite of explainability tools, including a heat map to show them where the AI was looking and a differential diagnosis screen in order for them to be able to see all the different conditions that the model considered for this specific condition. How does it work when compared to dermatologists? Well, in the lab, when 167 dermatologists were given a subset of 300 biopsy verified images of moles, it outperformed them on all of the core category areas, but especially melanomas, where accuracy went, where the hit rate went from 53% to 85. It was the same when it came to gynecologists uh, and cervical cancer, where we outperformed them pretty drastically from 55 to 95. Well, that's all well and good, but how does it work in the real world? Well, at a one of our major hospitals in New York, uh, we did this case study. Um, so we had two sets of dermatologists, and we basically took a look at all their biopsies and saw what their hit rates were for each of their biopsies. Uh, so the literature states that the hit rate should be a little under one in three, um, and it looks like our control group hit basically hit that right on the head, uh, slightly outperformed it. But for the experimental group, they drastically outperformed it. Um, so they had a hit rate of about 64%. So for every three biopsies they do, a little under two of them will actually be malignant, which is quite a jump. Um, and that hospital was very, very happy with these results. Um, meanwhile, during the current crisis, what we've also been doing is assisting physicians with other tasks that we can help automate um, and help kind of speed up their workflows for. So for one example, um, diagnosing viral pneumonias versus bacterial pneumonias uh, in chest x-rays. Uh, identifying the differences between COVID and COVID-based viral pneumonias and other viral pneumonias in CT scans. Um, and also diversifying and stratifying risk for patients with diabetes and heart disease when it came to COVID. So things like, hey, should you be using ACE, uh, ACE2 inhibitors and things like that. Um, in these patients, will it increase their risk? We tested to over 205,000 patients and caught over 2,300 cases. And our team has been working tirelessly to make sure these tools fit seamlessly into clinicians' workflows. Because the only thing worse than a tool that doesn't work is a tool that doesn't work with you. We are backed by all of these wonderful investors, including Plug and Play. And the reason I'm here today is I want to ask you to please come with us and help us build the future of healthcare. Wonderful. Thank you, Ariel and the Lazarus team. Um, so up next, we have Generations E. So they're developing an AI-driven cancer biopsy diagnostic solution for pathologists. So welcome, Generations E. Hi everyone, my name is Jean and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Generation C. Generation C is an AI company based in Vancouver, Canada, focusing on providing excellent pathology service in cancer care with deep learning technology. With more than 1 billion biopsies to handle each year, pathology shortage is a common problem around the world. According to Philip Healthcare, pathology accounts for 41% of cancer diagnosis delays not to mention the advancement of molecular pathology as more workload to pathologists. However, this problem is not easy to solve. Almost all pathologists perform their work under the microscope manually. Therefore, training a new pathology takes a long time and is costly. AI is a solution to pathology shortage problem. Our goal is to develop an excellent AI pathology solution that will assist pathologists and eventually drive cancer diagnosis and treatment in pathology. In return, it provides accurate, fast, and affordable service for patients in cancer care. Compared to other vertical markets leveraging AI technology, medical industry is special. In order to learn the AI technology in clinical operation, our work requires best starters and a lot of them, machine learning scientists, and also engineers who put the AI models into a system so the data can use. Our team is a joint force in three fields, and own rich experience in lending AI technology in the market. Data is the king in deep learning technology. AI companies spend a lot of money on acquiring data in the medical industry, in particular pathology, where digitalization is not popular. Our partner's professional level is crucial to our success. 
Basic Cancer manages 5 million population cancer data and has the best cancer program around the world. Our AI team learns from the experienced pathologists at BC Cancer who are the leading doctors in clinical operation. Our BC Cancer Partnership brings a strong foundation as we develop our AI pathology solution. We have access to 5 million biopsy slides and we also have more than 100 pathologists helping us in labeling and reviewing our slides. With strong data source, the next step is about how to learn the AI technologies into the clinical operation. In order to make our product work, we work with pathologists directly and also have the BC Cancer to build a working model that allows hospital to apply into the clinical study and provide the data feedback directly. Here's an example of how pathologists at St. Paul's hospitals work with us on providing data feedback. Now with machine's help, data can evaluate cancer burden from the automatic calculation. Deep Sync focuses on solving two problems for pathologists and cancer patients. In diagnosis, we provide accurate and fast cancer region detection and direct analysis that pathologists need on pathology reporting. This provides objective diagnosis and also reduces diagnostic errors. As for treatment, we combine deep sync with BC Cancer's personalized genome program to automate cancer cell extraction process from biopsy slides to genome sequencing. This will help patients discover suitable drugs for target therapy. In 2019, we released our first version of this deep sync on colorectal cancer detection. In 2020, regardless of the pandemic impact, we are still striving to get our FDA clearance for our product because we believe cancer will not wait human beings for one year, even though we are going through the difficult times with the pandemic. The market potential is huge. From the basic, well, our service model is one-fourth of the percentage gap in North America, which is about 2.3 billion US dollars. So let's all work together to get this problem solved for pathology shortage while we are uh, fighting with the pandemic with all the human beings. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you to the Generations E team. So up next, we have Burn Along. So they provide a program for health and wellness content on a subscription basis. So welcome to the Burn Along team. Hi. I'm Daniel Friedman, co-CEO of Burn Along. We're changing lives by bringing people online the health and well-being programming that they need, and critically, critically especially today, the social motivation to do it. The youngest person who uses Burn Along is six weeks old. There are mummy and me classes, and the oldest person to date is 97 years old. We have classes for people with arthritis and Parkinson's disease and different chronic conditions. And those using us range from transportation companies to banks, to municipalities, to insurance. Let me start though by asking you, how many of you today exercised? And did you also look after your emotional health? Now, what about your family members, children, parents, grandparents, what did they do today? And the reason that I ask is because we have a systemic problem both here in the US and globally, where most people don't do the programming that they need to do. 80% of the population doesn't get the recommended levels of exercise, even outside of today's health crisis. Why don't people do what they need to do? Two big problems. Number one, a lack of relatability, and number two, a lack of social support to do it. To put it simply, imagine someone here in Baltimore who's 55 years old, 300 pounds and on diabetes medication. Seeing this image of a white 22 year old from LA with a six pack is not gonna inspire that person. You have to meet people where they are. And that's what Bunalong does. We partner with hundreds and hundreds of wellness instructors from across the country. And so we've got local relatable content spanning more than 45 categories so that whatever your age, interest or level, you can find what you need. And critically, we enable you to have the social support to do it. And so when you go online with Burn Along, you can see it's one of your favorite coworkers, your family members, your friends, or someone else with a similar interest or condition live on the screen. And then you can invite them 
to join you. And whatever your interest in type of class, we bring you that. There are cycling, adaptive workouts, sleep, mindfulness, self-defense, pet workouts, you name it, we have it. And you can do those classes on your own, or, and this is really popular, you can utilize the social component where you can actually see and hear others. So you've got that social motivation brought to you in your home. And that's why people show up and keep going because there are real people keeping them on target. Our partners range from insurance companies to cities to hospitals. And the reason why they're all partnering with us is that Burn Along works. We see that we outperform the industry 5X. And what's behind that is that combination of choice and social motivation. And what's especially interesting is that we see that more than 25% of classes taken on the platform are in the specialty and emotional support categories. So not only do we get more people participating in programming, but critically we get people and their families who previously weren't participating. The next step for us, and we're doing a fundraise later this year, is to focus on using the data that we're collecting to drive medical outcomes for people, as well as expand internationally. I'm Daniel Friedman, co-CEO of Burnalong. Would love to hear from you. You can reach me at my number or email address below. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Wonderful, thank you, Daniel. And those workout classes look so fun. Great, so up next we have Kinside, a platform for employees to easily access the childcare that they need. So welcoming Kinside. Hi, I'm Shadia Sakala, CEO and co-founder of Kinside. So Kinside is the most modern childcare benefit in the market today. Our membership gives employees access to over 1 million coveted childcare spots. I know there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of parents watching this, so you know the absolute pain that it is to find childcare, um, secure a spot that's available, and get the best rates. So with Kinside, we've addressed all of the pain points that parents have from finding high-quality, affordable childcare to booking tours, um, enrolling, and paying those childcare providers, not only with their own dollars, but also with their uh, pre-tax DCFSA dollars. So first, a note about the founding team. This guy right there. A note about the founding team. Uh, uh, we've all worked together in the past. We've actually built, um, collectively scaled a previous tech startup called Honeybug. Uh, scaled up to about $20 million in annual revenue and 120 employees. And during that time, during our time of fast growth from zero to 120 employees, we found that a ton of employees were having kits. And so for us, looking into or rather for me specifically, as I was heading HR as a co-founder at HoneyBook at some point, looking for a relevant childcare benefit um, became part of my job. And I just found that there was a huge gap in the market. So Kinsight is, an, uh, is a digital first modern childcare benefit. We also supplement our digital app component with an incredible customer service um, and trained uh, experts on the front line to help parents really take care of every part of their child care experience. Now here's the thing though, behind this amazing experience where a parent can filter uh, child care, um, their daycare preschool by location, budget, preferences, and so on, that's actually backed by real partnerships that we have into over 1 million child care slots. Make sure that you can see that. So we partner with the nation's absolute most top and reputable uh, child care chains, and we also work with the safest home-based daycares in America. Now, the reason that our app is able to actually surface the most transparent information, real-time dynamic information on openings, uh, you know, where is an opening for, say, a three-month-old versus a three-year-old that's really relevant for a parent looking for long-term child care, the reason we're able to surface that data is because our software ties into the software the back-end software of all of these daycare um, partners. We have nationwide coverage. We're working with over 2,000 employers today 
Uh, we do really well when we connect into in through TPAs and get bundled into their existing dependent care FSA or other uh, voluntary benefit products. Uh, employers love us because we scale up and down because of the nature of our membership that we can acquire daycares and preschools wherever an employer is located. Um, it takes us about three to about three or four weeks to get implemented up and running. Uh, when the employer shares more about their, empo their employee demographics, we actually go and bulk up our membership of daycares and preschools around their location, which means that we have a really scalable uh, solution. So here's the scary part, and uh, here's here's where here's the moment that we're in right now. We estimate that about 20% of centers, more than that probably, will not reopen. So when I say centers, I mean group-based care. It could be your home daycare, it could be the large center. We only work with licensed uh, group-based um, uh, centers. Um, so we predict that there's gonna be just a huge reshuffle that as employers are ready to get their engines up and running, about 20% minimum of their employees are not going to be able to find the childcare they need to resume engines. And so you can only imagine that the, the, the current childcare crisis is going to be compounded even more. Um, that's exactly what we're working, uh, what we're addressing at Kinside because we have exclusive partnerships with um, the most reputable, you know, uh, childcare chains. Um, we've actually been helping uh, secure a lot of spots for essential workers. And as states by states open, we actually have strategies towards getting employees in um, back to work in any given state as things reopen and childcare reopens. We are not currently fundraising. Uh, we recently raised about we've raised over 4.3 million dollars, both from Y Combinator as well as Initialized and many other elite Silicon Valley investors. Uh, our latest seed round was uh, just like last year. But we are actively, uh, we're, we're open to uh, conversations with strategic investors. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Shadia. And Kinside is doing some really great things in the childcare space. Um, so up next, and last but not least, this is the last startup of the day. So we have SIFT Healthcare, who's transforming healthcare payments through advanced data science. So welcoming SIFT. I'm Bethany, here to tell you about SIFT Healthcare. Healthcare is hard. Getting paid in healthcare is even harder. Between declining reimbursements, rising input costs, growing patient financial responsibility, and an increasing cost to collect earned revenue, providers are in the expensive position of having to spend more and more money to recoup fewer dollars. Every day, healthcare organizations provide services to the tune of millions of dollars and have little idea as to if or when they'll get paid. Fundamentally, healthcare providers have become lending institutions. They're having to provide flexible payment options to patients and stay in step and in tune with payer reimbursement trends. It is clear that healthcare payments and the revenue cycle need data science to create new efficiencies. Much like the interoperability is a challenge on the clinical side, the same type of challenges face the administrative side. Far too many decisions are made retrospectively with raw SQL dumps and pivot tables. SIF brings the same artificial intelligence that's used by insurance payers and financial institutions to healthcare organizations. We help healthcare organizations leverage the well-developed technologies that are widely used in these other industries to remove waste and drive a better bottom line. First and foremost, SIF creates a common source of truth for healthcare payments data. We ingest massive amounts of payments data in various forms, and we do the heavy lifting of normalizing and organizing that data, making it accessible and usable. From there, we build any number of predictive models to address inefficiencies across the revenue cycle. It's one thing to apply AI to data, but actually operationalizing AI is where the true value lies. This is core to our approach at SIFT. Our AI-driven models provide actionable optimizations within providers' existing workflows. We drive machine learning into the revenue cycle. On the insurance reimbursement side, SIF uses AI to enable healthcare providers to focus on the right denials, the ones that drive revenue. SIF identifies which denials are likely to be paid by insurance payers and which ones will never be paid. This allows providers to be more efficient and more strategic with their teams. They're equipped to work the right denials. SIF provides a daily rank-ordered list of denials based on ROI. 
Rather than work denials based on dollar amount or date of service, SIF ranks denials by the likelihood of payment. We help providers stop chasing dollars that will never be paid and focus only on the denials that turn into real dollars. On the other side of the equation with patient payments, SIF's AI identifies how much each patient will pay, when they will pay their bill, what payment plan to offer them, and when and how to contact each patient. These predictive models enable providers to collect the maximum payment from each patient by proactively making contact and offering flexible payment options. This increases dollars collected while maintaining a strong and healthy patient relationship. The combination of SIF's data platform and machine learning optimizations enables SIF to provide a new level of intelligence around revenue and payments. SIF provides accessible and transparent reporting on payment trends, revenue cycle work efforts, and the efficacy of our own AI models through our interactive RevTrack reporting tool. RevTrack unifies metrics across the revenue cycle, monitors KPIs, visualizes payment trends, and tracks operational drivers like agent productivity and call adherence. In addition to revenue cycle reporting, SIF provides quality analysis on a variety of revenue drivers, using AI to forecast payments and manage the cost to collect. SIF truly enables a data-driven approach to revenue cycle management. SIF unlocks the power of providers' own data to bring a new level of intelligence to healthcare payments, providing actionable insights that improve operations, as well as machine learning optimizations that accelerate cash flow and capture more earned revenue. Thank you. Please reach out with any questions. Wonderful, and thank you to the SIF Healthcare team. So that goes to conclude our startup pitches. Up next, we're extremely excited to present our Corporate Innovation Award. So the Batch Health, a Health Batch X Innovation Award goes to an organization that's been one of the most important entities in the world against COVID-19 and bringing us back to normalcy. They were proactive and forward thinking when they became a partner, already prioritizing a pandemic response. When COVID-19 came to the US, they were incredibly impressed by their ability to move quickly, to bring up online portals, to work across large agencies and to expedite life-saving opportunities. So we're humbled um, to support them and to have them as a partner with us on our healthcare platform. So we're pleased to welcome the Division of the US Department of Health and Human Services, BARDA. Um, so BARDA stands for the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. So representing them to accept the award is their new director, uh, Dr. Sandeep Patel, who will be giving us a few words. So congratulations, Sandeep. Thank you, Ava, thank, and thanks everyone. Thanks, we really, uh, I'm humbled and, and appreciate this and, and I'm very happy on behalf of my, the 270 or 80 colleagues uh, across BARDA um, uh, that you know, I think really do deserve uh, recognition for the amazing work that they've done um, over the last several months for, for COVID. And just to give you guys some, some quick background, um, BARDA is, if you're not aware, is a, is a group within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And they, they were really designed specifically to respond to situations like we find ourselves in, which is to you know, build uh, and respond, build new technologies that can respond quickly to, to emergencies. Um, you know, everything from hurricanes to nuclear attacks and chemical attacks to, to outbreaks like we're seeing now. Um, and it's a group that often doesn't get recognized, so I'm really happy um, uh, on, again, on behalf of my colleagues for, for this. And thank you all for your recognition. So Plug and Play also has been a, a, an amazing partner, um, joined our uh, Health Accelerator Network uh, last September. And we just, we really couldn't be more thrilled at this. Um, you know, I think the needs for health security are, are not really well known um, across the, the health and technology uh, communities. And so we really appreciate the work Plug and Play and others have done um, to, to help raise awareness of, of needs. Um, and, and you guys have been amazing partners. Um, and I think especially now in the sort of 21st century where, uh, you know, every new threat uh, and every new situation requires a different way of thinking, requires a different you know, you know, set of uh, innovators. Um, and so having the, the nimbleness and responsivity that, that, you know, you guys bring plug and play and, and the community broadly, um, I think it's just critical to, to advancing uh, human health and wellness, which is what we're focused on. So, um, 
Yeah, in particular, I wanted to thank Ava and, and Zachary and Astrid and, and many of the others at Plug and Play that we've had good relationships with. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to continuing the relationship and especially in, in broadening our, you know, our scope of where we should be looking for innovation, because I think that's our focus is we want to look in, and uncover rocks that we don't normally look at. And we want to, you know, uh, think about technologies that we don't normally think about in, in helping sort of the work that we're doing. So again, thank you. I appreciate this is this is amazing. Thank you all. Yeah, of course. And thank you. Thank you to the BARDA team. We really appreciate um, and are humbled by the partnership that we have with you all. Um, shout out to uh, Donna, to Abe, to Rowan and Justin, who have been the champions from BARDA that we've been working so closely with. Um, and we're excited to continue to keep working with you, um, especially as we fight COVID. Um, great. So up next, um, a few last things before we conclude our four-day summer summit. Um, so our Batch 11 program for health is set for the fall and is coming up. Um, we have our selection day coming up on August 20th, where our partners will be choosing the next batch of companies to come into our accelerator program. So very excited about that. Um, and we have our winter summit um, concluding that program on the week of November 17th through 19th. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, Again, we hope you found this session and this whole summit to be insightful and inspiring to you. Um, again, if you have any questions for the startups or would like to connect with them and set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting, you can scan the QR code here, um, connecting you to Brella, which is our networking platform. Um, today is the last day to do so. So we definitely encourage everyone to sign up and take advantage. And lastly, uh, if you're interested in connecting and learning more about our programs, or if you're interested in partnering with us to innovate healthcare together, um, I encourage you to reach out to myself or to Zachary, who um, opened up this session with you all. Uh, my email is listed on the screen. So with that, thank you all so much again for joining us um, and for joining us throughout the Summer Summit, and see you next time.